Now, I know the tradition here is for uh, me to have a couple of sentences of introduction just to kind of remind you that, hey, Mike's getting ready to speak and preach, so you need to focus your attention up here. Uh, sometimes I try to get it funny just to loosen you up so we can get this uh, sermon thing on the road. But honestly, um, what we're about to read, if you hear it and really take it to heart and really begin to understand what Jesus is telling us in the concluding uh, uh, paragraphs of chapter 5, honestly, some of you are going to pass out. And if you pass out standing up, it's a long way to the floor. So I'm going to just have you uh, seated and just stay seated, and we're going to uh, work through these passages as we prepare to come to the, to the table of the Lord's Supper. I know we also have the screens that we put the words up, but sometimes you get lazy when we do that. Uh, you think, well, the words are up on the screen, they were in church on Sunday, but I don't have to take these words with me. But these words leave with us. These are Jesus' words to us. And so I want you to open uh, your Bible uh, to chapter 5 of uh, the Gospel of Matthew. If you did not bring one, there should be one in the pew there in front of you, even in the chapel. Uh, and uh, open the Bible uh, and kind of follow along with us today. I want you to kind of see that what I'm pointing at is really in here. Hmm. Uh, sometimes you look at me like I'm kind of making this up as I go along. Uh, but... Um, these are, these are some really, really hard words. And one of the things that we have found out about the Sermon on the Mount, well, is, is Jesus is not playing. And, and if he's not playing, if he really means for us to do what he's saying, then, then, then we're in a mess. You know when somebody says, hey, don't worry about it, you're only human. They're not giving you a compliment. You, you have, have, you, have you realized that when somebody says, you know, hey, you're human? That's not a, 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 a reward. It usually means we've done something stupid, something that we know we should have done better, that we're feeling real bad about it, and our friend in an effort to console us says, hey, you're human. We know we are flawed creatures. Uh, we know we mess up. Uh, and, and we know that that's part of the human experience which is one of the reasons that verse 48 is so hard to read. Uh, look at what Jesus is saying as he concludes chapter 5. Be perfect even as your heavenly Father is perfect. Be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Now, we've already seen example enough today already that that's probably not going to happen. And a lot of us are reading that going, well, if that's the goal, then I have to be perfect. Then I have to go through a day without a mistake. Then I can't ever break a rule or forget a law or, or uh, you know, forget to open the door for my wife or not take the garbage down. If it, just any little thing like that, and I'm not perfect, so the whole shebang is shot. Why am I even trying? If I can't hit this goal, why am I even trying? Nobody can do this. And that's one of the struggles with the Sermon on the Mount is you read it and you study it and you go, <coughs> who can live this way? Well, the short answer to that is Jesus did. And the life of Jesus on earth, his earthly ministry, the incarnation of Christ, uh, God in human form tells us that one, not only is a life like this possible, but it is expected. Okay, we are expected to do, to do this way. And it helps us to kind of understand that what Jesus is saying here is not be perfect as you and I would understand perfect. The Greek understanding of perfect being without flaw, uh, without any kind of nick or any kind of, of, of uh, less than ideal aspect to it. Uh, that is a Greek understanding, philosoph uh, philosophical understanding. It's not Hebraic. Uh, the Hebrew understanding uh, is this word, Telios. Uh, it means goal, finish. Okay? Uh, we believe not in a circular view of history. We believe in a linear view of history that we are headed toward the telios, the goal, uh, the finish part. And this is what Jesus is saying here. Be finished. Be complete. Be mature. Even as your Heavenly Father is complete, finished, mature. In short Alabama slang, 
Jesus is telling his followers, grow up. Grow up. Now, we spend so much time in Southern Baptist life talking about being born again. We never talk about being grown again. To be born is to have the chance to grow. That's the point of following Christ. But we get, so, we get so excited that we're born again that we spend all our lives in the waiting pool. We never get in the deep end of the pool. We always stay in the real shallow end and we can make a really big splash, but we never go anywhere. And we make a really big splash because, hey, we're born again, we're born again, we're born again. That's great. But the goal, and, and don't hear me discounting that at all. Some of you kind of wake up and go sleep, wake up, and you hear me say something like that, and you go, well, Mike didn't believe in being born again. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying born again is where we start again. But the point is to grow again. So grow up. As you are a follower of Christ, grow into his image, grow up in your faith. There is a point to our life. There is a teleos. Find it and move toward it. Now, how do you do that? Well, Jesus gives us a handful of paragraphs to show us how. And the first one, the first one is about loving your enemies. You've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Not only did they hear it say, heard it said, they, they celebrated that. That was a great man. A great man loved his family, loved his friends, and destroyed his enemies. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father in heaven. Verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Remember we talked about how that meant spitting image? So that you may be called the spitting image of your Father in heaven, for he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good, and the sins reign on the righteous and the unrighteous. For if you love those who love you, what reward will you have? Do not tax collectors do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what are you doing out of the ordinary? Don't the Gentiles do the same? But be perfect, therefore, even as your Father in heaven is, is, is perfect. Grow up. And one of the ways that you grow up is by, is by being so filled with the presence of the risen Christ that whoever hurts you, whoever squeezes you, whoever wounds you, brings out the essence of Christ in you. If you squeeze a toothpaste tube, toothpaste comes out. Why? Because that's what's in there. Okay? So in your worship, in your, in your study, in your learning more about Jesus, the, the, the goal is to press more of him in and more of us out. Okay? So that someone, when somebody attacks us, now understand, Jesus said you have enemies. I mean, Jesus' thing here about pray for those who persecute you was not just idle talk. That was happening. There were spies listening to Jesus even as he talked in the Sermon on the Mount. They were reporting back to Herod. They were reporting back to the Romans. They were reporting back to the religious leaders. This was a real deal. They knew it. Okay? This was not play. Uh, what I love about Jesus is that he talks about life as it really is. No games. No, 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 no wish it was different. This is how it really is. You and I have enemies. Now, sometimes we have these enemies because we have wounded people. Sometimes we have enemies because they're responding uh, to uh, the presence of Christ in us. Uh, sometimes we have enemies because people don't like the way you look. We have enemies who respond to us out of their brokenness and out of their woundedness for all kinds of reasons. But let's begin with the reality. We have enemies. We have people who are trying to hurt us. We have people who are trying to take things from us and who are trying to w ruin not only our life but our reputation and on and on and on. We have these people in our life. Okay? Now, how do we deal with them? Now, the world says you take them out. Okay? You, you, you know, you, you pull Clint Eastwood, make my day. And, and some of us have a board of directors in our head making the decisions, and we have invited Clint to be on our board of directors, and we will listen to him on occasion. But Jesus said, love is not a contract. And we think it is, don't we? If... If we call uh, you and have you over for dinner, we won't call you back till you call us and have us over for dinner. It's your turn. 
okay? If you buy me a Christmas present and you give me a $25 gift card, I've got to go get at least a $25 gift card for you, okay? I can't give you a $10 gift card. No, 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 because presents have to be even, equal. And we've all had that moment when somebody surprised you at Christmas and gave you a present worth far more than you had given them. And you would have to say something like, oh, I forgot your present. <laughs> and you had to go buy something else because it's a contract, right? A gives to B, B gives to A. That's the way it works. That's the way the pagan world works. Love is not a contract in Scripture. Love is a covenant where God says to his people through Abraham, through Moses, through King David, ultimately and supremely through Jesus Christ, and says what? You are mine no matter what. I will love you no matter what. You cannot go anywhere where I won't be there to love you. If I, make my, if I ascend to the highest heights, you are there. If I unroll my sleeping bag in hell, you are there. No matter where I go, you're already there. You cannot go far enough that the love of God is not already there, ready to bring you back. And if it's there to bring you back, which means it's further than you can go, so it can bring you back. You can't do that. That's the covenant. We respond to that covenant. We respond in freedom to that covenant. Knowing we will never be even, we'll never be equal, we'll never be able to pay God back what He has given to us. But that's the way we live in the covenant, and that's the way we live to each other. Okay? We live in covenant. We, we, know, we know understanding that the presence of the risen Christ is in us. This is the secret, Paul tells the Colossians, that's been hidden till now. What is that? Christ in you, the hope of glory. You cannot hold the, the, the ocean in a thimble. So as Christ fills your life, your, his love, his mercy, his grace will slosh out. So when you are wounded, when you are nicked, when you are attacked, what will slosh out of you will be love. Now, let's understand. Let's, let's talk practically about how this works. Now, you know me. I'm from Alabama. I'm a redneck. Somebody attacks me. My first thing is, let's move the furniture back. We're going to fight. That's my first response, okay? That is not a godly response. I didn't say that. I said it was my first response. And it gets to about right here, right here, before some part of me jumps up and grabs it and says, no, that's not how we're going to respond. And a part of me is going, but I really want to. No, that's not how we're going to respond. But he really deserves it. That's not how we're going to respond, and let's not bring up what people deserve or we're going to be here a while. <laughs> See, we always want justice for the other guy, mercy for us. <laughs> All right? That's not, we're not going to do that. Why? Because the person who hurt me, the person who attacked me, is somebody that Jesus Christ died for. Now, I want you to think about this. Let's say you do release it. Let's say you do get in touch with your inner redneck. All right? And you jump him. And you jump him because he's wrong and he deserves it. And you are winning it. You're on top of him. You're tagging his head. And that's when Jesus comes back. <laughs> Let me explain. Now, how's that going to look? How are you going to explain that? This is somebody he died for and you're beating his head in. No, no. No, 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 no. We're going to respond the same way Jesus did. Because we are the spitting image of our Father, we're going to respond that way. Now, we, we get hurt. We do. But you do not respond with violence with more violence. You don't overcome hate with more hate. You don't fight fire with fire. I tell you this all the time. The world says you fight fire with fire. No, you don't. Fire department fights it with water. I've never seen them go out there and say, this house is on fire, set these two houses on fire, and we'll get this fire out. Okay, you laugh. That's, that's stupid. Nobody would do that. But how many of us have said in a common day, we're going to fight fire with fire here, folks? No, we fight fire with water. We fight hate with love. There's a river that flows from the throne of God. So teaches Revelation. Jesus says, if you knew who was talking to you, water would come from you, living water would spring from you. That would, remember what he told her, never run dry. 
The source of your love is not the love from the other person. It's not how other people feel about me. My source of the love that we have in us is the river that never runs dry. So I'm always responding out of, out of Christ's love for me. So I'm going to go in prayer, and I'm going to say, this hurt. Uh, this is what he said. I don't like this. I'm wounded. I'm angry. I'm mad. I, I don't like this. And then Jesus, in his mercy and his, and, his, and, 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 and his love for me, is going to sit down and talk with me and say, why did it hurt? Was it important? He made fun of your shoes. That's why you're mad. Are shoes important? No. Then why are you mad? Let's get angry about something that matters. Okay. He said something to this. that, that he, he threatened this. Does he have the power to do that? No. Then why are you scared? Don't worry about the man who takes your life. Worry about the person that would take your soul. So in that moment of prayer, Christ is going to bring healing to me, going to bring strength to me, going to bring love to me, so that the next time my enemy comes, I won't respond out of anger, but I'll respond out of love because of the work Christ is doing in me. Now you say, Mike, that won't work. It works all the time. Joseph, sold by his brothers into slavery. And whenever we read that story, some of you really get excited because you say, I wish I could have sold my brother then my life would be very different. Joseph confronts his brother at the end of the story. Now he's the second most powerful man in Egypt, second only to Pharaoh, and he says to his brothers, what you meant for evil, what you did to destroy me, God used for good. There is no amount of hurt that anybody can bring to your life that can overcome, outdo what the power of the living God can do in your life. So we don't live in that fear. We, love, don't, we don't live like pagans. We don't have contracts. We have covenants. And we're going to love you no matter what. Because that's the way that Jesus has shown us. Now, how does that work out? How does that look? We'll look at the paragraphs before. You've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, which was actually a, a statement of mercy. You know that? Do you know that? If somebody takes your eye, you can't kill them. The only thing you can do is take their eye. You're limited. And the wound you can give back is mercy. Eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, don't resist evil. On the contrary, if anyone slaps your right cheek, turn to him the other. If anyone wants you to sue you, take away your shirt, let him have your coat. If anybody forces you to go one mile, go two. And give to the one who asks, and don't turn away from the one who borrows from you. A Roman soldier could make you carry his bag for a, for a mile, but no more than a mile. That was, uh, that was the law. And it was always a big scene when that mile came and the person would throw the bag off in disgust. But the soldier was done. Jesus said, you never respond to a situation, no matter how humiliating the other person thinks it may be to you, being a victim. If you make me carry this, if you say carry my, my, my bag for a mile, I'm going to carry it a mile. But I'm going to carry it two miles. I'm going to outlove the hate you bring to me. See what he's doing? You can't make me do anything. I'm going to choose to do this. I'm always going to act out of the overflow of Christ in my life. I am free in Christ. I'm not going to be a slave to you or anybody else. I will make this out of my own choice, out of the overflow of my own heart. I'm not going to be a victim anymore. And how does that happen? Well, it happens with integrity. And that's what he's talking about in verse 33. Again, you've heard it said to our ancestors, you must keep and you must not break your oath. You must keep your oath before the Lord. But I tell you, don't take an oath at all, either by heaven because it is God's throne, or by the earth because it is footstool, or by Jerusalem because it is the city of the great king. Neither should you swear by your head because you cannot make a single hair white or black, but let your yes be yes and your no be no. Anything more than that from the evil one. Uh, we're familiar with veneer, and most time when we say the word veneer, we, we have the assumption that it is cheap and tacky. Uh, oh, that's veneer. We, we don't want that. But there are beautiful works of veneer. Okay? There, there are. There are artists who work with very thin sheets of a very expensive wood that can take it and mold it and, and, and place it so that it gives the appearance of lavishly expensive wood. The only difference is if you nick that veneer, if you push that through that veneer, it's not real. 
It's not that wood. It's not mahogany all the way through. It's not cherry all the way through. It's chopped up pine. And everybody gets, gets really, really upset because it's just the superficial, because it gave the appearance of beauty but wasn't solid. Uh, because uh, there's more Christian publishing in Nashville than anywhere else, because all the Christian music is here, because all the denominations are here, Nashville has a lot of Jesus talk. But what I found out in my 21 years here is that we have made this veneer of Jesus, and we have pasted that veneer of Jesus on everything. If it stands still long enough, we'll put a little Jesus veneer right on top of you. But let something happen. Let something nick that veneer. Let something push through it. And it's not real. Amen. Integrity. What you say is who you are. What you say is who you are. There's no discrepancy between what I say and who I am. That's what Jesus is talking about. We talk about steel having integrity if it can bear the load that the architect says it will bear. When a, when a steel beam loses integrity, it breaks, it cracks, and the load falls. That's what Jesus is talking about here. Integrity. And the transition chapter is one of the most abused chapters in all scriptures. It's a chapter on divorce. You've heard it said. You can divorce your wife by giving her a writ of divorce. But I say, no man should divorce his wife. And if you do, you force her into adultery. And if you marry a woman who's divorced, you've committed adultery. Now, there has been no more abused passage than this. Okay? Let me give you the cir circumstances. A man could literally divorce his wife if she burnt his toast. If he got up and he was no longer happy, he could give her a piece of paper and say, we're divorced. And she was released from the house. She was out. She had no way to make a living. She had no way to take care of herself. And if the children didn't take, up, uh, at, didn't take up the slack to take care of her, she was forced into a life of poverty or prostitution. Jesus said you do not treat people like that. Okay? What's he saying? He's saying we need to put the holy back in matrimony. Okay? Let me give you a typical wedding. The couple falls in love. They start dating. Everybody says they're cute. Their peers approve. Their families approve. They're cute. They make a good couple. They're going to be, make a good plan. A date is reserved. Thousands and thousands of dollars are spent on cars, dresses, bridesmaids, groomsmen, all right, helicopters, everything. You know, you think I'm being funny. Uh, you know, listen, you know, it, it's, it, we have this wedding of the century. And then they call me and say, well, we want you there. You, ha you have to be there because this is important, da, 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 da. And I'll have the couple and I'll look at the groom and I'll say, tell me when God told you she was the one. They look at me the same way you're looking at me. Huh? Whoa, 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 whoa. If you are a Christ follower, if your life belongs to him, if he's Lord of your life, you cannot get married unless he gives you permission. You cannot get married to that person unless he's given you permission that this is the person I want you to be married to. You cannot get married unless you understand that the most important person in this marriage is Christ. Not you, not your spouse. Idolatry is when you place anything or anybody rightfully reserved in the place for God. That's it. That's idolatry. Adultery is the, play, is the time when you place anything or anybody in the place rightfully reserved for the spouse. Most time men do that with careers. Women traditionally have done it with children. But now women are in careers like men, and guess what? Women are now doing it with careers. Behind that is a secret idolatry of self. I'm more important. I'm more important in this relationship, and it's, it's what matters to me that is important, and if she is part of what makes me happy, she can stay. But if she doesn't make me happy, she can go. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. If she doesn't make me happy. Well, Mike, don't I have a right to be happy? No. No, you don't. I've read it. It's not in there. I've read it looking for loopholes. You know me. It's not in there. The question is not you happy, but is Christ pleased? The question is not is she happy, but is Christ honored? I tell you a great mystery, Paul tells the Ephesians, but I'm talking about Christ and his church. And when the world sees somebody, a husband, love his wife, 
The way Christ loved the church, laying his life down for her day in and day out, they want to know more about that kind of marriage when they see a wife loving her husband that way, laying her life down from the life she received from him. They want to know more about that kind of marriage because it is a sacrament. It is a method that grace is offered to our world because some of your homes will be the first place that some of our broken friends find grace. Your marriage will be the first time they see love really lived out in a way that makes a difference. This is what a grown-up life looks like. It puts holy in matrimony, integrity, loves enemies, never responds out of victimhood, a life that is growing up. Now, you read that and your first response is great. I can't do that. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm too far away. I, I know. That's the same reaction I had every time I read it. I can't do this. No, you can't. Christ in you can. We thought for a long time that the four minute mile was impossible for a human body to, to do. The body was limited. It could not do a four-minute mile. Now we find out we can. And what we're beginning to understand is what is actually possible is a lot more than what we think is possible. I know, you're looking at the end of the teleos and you're going, I can't get there. That's why we're coming to the table because the table is where we remember that we are not there yet. It is a place where we start. The manger was certainly no place for a king to be born, but it was a good place to start. A man stands in front of Jesus with his sick child. And Jesus says, everything is possible for those who believe. And the man says, I believe. And then he hesitates and he's honest with Jesus. And he says, but please help my unbelief. Okay. It's a good place to start. The focus for this moment now is not how far we have to go but that we start.